My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. This is Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. Come on, let's all go to the lobby. Because people are staring at us listening to these shows while we're in the theater. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Hi there, partners, and welcome to the final episode of Season 13 and Part 2 of The Last Ride. I'm Jack Ward with the co-host with the most, David All. Hello, David. How are you doing this evening? Uh, I'm done tooting. Thank you. <laughs> that Western accent is spot on, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's our final episode of Season 13. Any thoughts about this season? Oh, I, I still can't believe that it's almost, that, that it is over. Really? I know. Um, so this year, oh, there's been a lot of great audio dramas. And of course, and I was checking in from all of the No Sleep podcast venues as I was traveling across the States with them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, it's been it's been quite a ride. Yeah, we've had a ton of new people. And speaking of No Sleep, I remember going to see you live for yes, the first time in like course. seven years at the time. Yes. Right. And back that was October. just this season back in October as well. Yeah. We, of course, started Sonic Echo mm-hmm. again. Again, since I guess it's been a couple of years, this time with Jeffrey Billard and Lothar Toppen. And that came out of, of course, the tragedy and the loss of Bill Hallwig that happened at this time mm-hmm. last season, last year. But uh, and we had a ton of new stuff that came in that was really exciting. And a lot of new stuff from old people, too. Like Fred Greenhalgh was able to send us one of his new shows. And it's always great to get both old and new collected. Absolutely. I'm just so grateful every year. There's so much and more and more. I never run out. Yes, uh, because there's so many people out there. We've had Rabbit's Podcast. We've had Attention Hellmart Shoppers, which is one of my favorite podcasts out there at the moment. <laughs> of course, we've had the wonderful John Bell with Bells in the Bat Free. And we, we even went on the Bat Free. Yes, we did. Uh, <laughs> That's right. We had a very special one with Greg Taylor, too. That's it. Yes. That was, yes. oh, just, again, so many memories. We could be here all day, but we don't have that much time because without further ado, we have to finish off off this season and this ride properly with Graphic Audio's adaptation of the classic tale from Robert E. Howard, The Last Ride. And it all begins right here on the Sonic Society. Anything I can do? In spite of his pain, the boy grinned. Thought so. Nobody but a Laramie could ride so reckless and shoot so straight. Oh, seems funny being plugged by a Laramie after they was my heroes most of my life. What? I always wanted to be like you. Nobody could ride and shoot and fight like Laramie's. That's why I joined up with these polecats. They said they were starting up a gang that was to be just like the Laramie's. They ain't. They're dirty coyotes. Once I started it with them, though, I had to stick. (coughs) Buck was speechless. You you better go and race posse if you're aiming to get them. There's going to be hell to pay tonight. How's that? <laughs> you got him scared. <laughs> Harrison's afraid he might have told Joel Waters he was boss man. That's why he come here last night. They aimed to keep stealing for another month. Old Harrison would have had most of the ranches around here by then. Foreclosed mortgages. <sighs> when Mark Raleigh failed to get you. Harrison sent out word for the boys to get together here today. They figured on hunting you down. If the posse from San Leon hadn't already got you. If they find out you didn't know nothing and hadn't told nobody nothing, they just aim to kill you and go on like the plan from the first. <clears throat> but if they didn't get you or found out you talked, they aim to make their big cleanup tonight. And then ride. What's the big cleanup? They're going down tonight and burn Joel Waters' ranch buildings. 
and the sheriffs, and some of the other big ones. They'll drive all the cattle off to Mexico over the old Laramie Trail. Then old Harrison will divide the loop, and the gang will scatter. If he finds you ain't spilled the works about him being the top man, he'll stay in San Leon. That was his idea from the start. Ruin the ranchers, buy up the outfits cheap, and be the king of San Leon. How many men's he got? Between 25 and 30. <coughs> oh, I ought not to be squealing, maybe. Tank the Laramie way. But I wouldn't to nobody but a Laramie. Laramie was silent, calculating the force he could put in the field. Waters' cowpunchers were all he could be sure of. Six or seven men at the most, not counting the wounded Waters himself. The odds were stacking up. Got smoke. Laramie rolled a cigarette and placed it between the kid's blue lips. <laughs> Looking back down the canyon, Laramie saw men saddling mounts. Precious time was passing, but he couldn't bring himself to leave the dying boy. Get going. You got a tough job ahead of you. But I'm betting on the Laramies. <laughs> the real ones. cigarette slipped from his lips. <sighs> Laramie rose heavily and groped for his horse, trembling in the shade of the rock. Another debt to be marked up against the Laramies. He swung aboard and galloped through the tunnel to where his own horse was waiting, a faster mount than the one he was riding. It was nearly noon when Laramie pulled up his sweating horse at the porch of Joel Waters' Box W Ranch House. There were no hands in sight. Anyone here? Yeah? It was one of Joel's older ranch hands who helped him with his housekeeping. Where's Waters? He gone to town to see the doctor and get his leg fixed. Slim Jones drove him in the buckboard. He should be back tonight. Damn! Buck's plan had been to lead a band of men straight to the outlaw's hideout and bottle them up in their stronghold before they could scatter out over the range in their planned raid. Joel Waters' cowpunchers wouldn't follow a stranger without their boss's orders, and only Waters could convince the bellicose citizens of San Leon that Laramie was on the level. Time was flying, and every minute counted. There was only one risky course left open. <laughs> He met no one on the road to San Leon, for which he was thankful. When he drew up in the outskirts of the town, his horse was drawing laboring breaths. He knew the animal would be useless if he had to dust out of town with a posse on his heels. Laramie knew of a back alley that led to the doctor's office, and by which he hoped to make it unseen. He dismounted and headed down the alley, leading the gelding by the reins. He caught sight of the little adobe shack where the town's one physician lived and worked. Hey! Laramie! Buck looked behind him to see a man at the end of the alley. It was Mart Rawley, and Laramie ducked behind his horse, cursing his luck. Rawley must have been prowling around the town, expecting and watching for him. Laramie's back! Hey! Bill, Lawrence, Joe, everybody! Laramie's in town again! This way! <laughs> Laramie forked his Mustang and spurred it into a lumbering run. Lead was singing down the alley as Laramie burst onto Main Street and saw Joel Waters sitting in a chair on the porch of the doctor's house. Joe! Get all the men you can rustle and head for the Diablos. I'll leave a trail for you to follow. I found the gang at the old hideout, and they're coming out tonight for a big cleanup. Uh, all right. Then he was off again. A horse and a foot that came at him, shooting as they ran. His way to open country was blocked, and his horse was exhausted. Buck wheeled and rode to the right, headed for a narrow alley. It led between two buildings to a side street, and wasn't wide enough for a horse to pass through. Maybe that was the reason it had been left unguarded. Laramie reached it, threw himself from his saddle, and dived into the narrow alley. For an instant, his mount, standing with drooping head in the opening of the alley, shielded his master from bullets, though Laramie had not intended sacrificing his horse for his own hide. He bolted out the alley's other end. What? There, blocking his way in the side street, stood a figure beside a black racing horse. Laramie's gun came up. Then he stopped short, mouth open in amazement. 
It was Judy Anders who stood beside the black horse. Before he could speak, she sprang forward and thrust the reins in his hand. Just take him and go. He's fast. What? Why are you- Hurry! <gasps> Buck grabbed the horn and swung up. I sure thank you kindly, miss. Don't thank me. You're a Laramie and ought to be hung, but you fought beside Bob yesterday when he needed help. The Anders pay their debts. Ugh, will you go? Three of the townsmen appeared with lifted guns around a corner of a nearby building. They hesitated as they saw the girl near him. See Joe Waters at the doctor's office! And he was off for the open country, and not at all sure that Judy had understood him. Maddened citizens ran for their mounts, too frenzied to even notice Judy. Stop! Stop! Wait! Listen to me! Deaf to her cries, they screamed past her and burst out into the open. What's going on? It was Joel Waters limping out of the alley, supported by the doctor. What in the devil does all this mean? Where's Buck? There he goes, with all the idiots in San Leon after him. Uh, not all the idiots. I'm still here. That boy must be crazy coming here. I yelled myself deep at them fools, but they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen to me either. But they won't catch him, ever, on that black of mine. And maybe when they come limping back, they'll be cooled down enough to hear the truth. If they won't listen to me, they will to Bob. To Bob? Has he come too? I was just getting ready to come over and see him again when Joel came in for his leg to be dressed. Bob came out of it just a little while ago, Doc. He's still groggy and uncertain as to just what happened. He doesn't know who it was who shot him, but he knows it wasn't Buck. The last thing he remembers was Buck running some little distance ahead of him. The bullet came from behind. He thinks a stray slug from the men behind him hit him. I don't believe it was a stray. I got a darn good idea who shot Bob. I'm gonna go talk to Well, now you better not bother Bob too much right now. I'll go over there. Better go in a hurry. He was pulling on his boots and yelling for our cook to bring him his gun belt when I left. What? Why, he shouldn't get up yet. Judy, can you help Mr. Waters here? Of course. <laughs> the doctor transferred Waters' arm from his shoulder to that of the girl and hurried away toward the house where Bob Anders was supposed to be convalescing. Why did Buck come back here? Yeah, from what he hollered at me as he lit past, I reckon he's found something up in the Diablos. He'd come for help. Probably went to my ranch first, and finding me not there, risked his neck coming on here. Said to send men after him, to follow signs he'd leave. I relayed that information to Slim Jones, my foreman. Doc lent Slim a horse, and Slim's hightailing it for the Box W right now to round up my ranch hands and hit the trail. As soon as these San Leon hotheads run out of steam chasing that black streak you gave Buck, they'll be pulling back into town. This time, I bet they'll listen. I'm glad he didn't shoot Bob. But what? Why did he come back to San Leon in the first place? He come to pay a debt he figured he owed on behalf of his no-count brothers. His saddlebags is full of gold he aims to give back to the citizens of this here ungrateful town. Why? I had no idea. Then Buck never robbed or stole like his brothers? Of course he didn't. Think I'd have kept on being his friend all his life if he had? Buck ain't to blame for what his brothers did. He's straight and he's always been straight. But he was with him when... I know. But he didn't shoot your dad. That was Luke. And Buck was with him only because they made him. He was nothing but a kid. Judy did not reply and Old Waters, noting the soft new light glowing in her eyes, wisely said nothing. In the meantime, the subject of their discussion was proving the worth of the sleek piece of horse flesh under him. He grinned as he saw the distance between him and his pursuers widen. In half an hour, he could no longer see the men who hunted him. He pulled the black to an easier swinging gait that would eat up the miles for long hours and headed for the Diablos. But the desperate move he was making was not dominating his thoughts. He was mulling over a new puzzle. Why Judy Anders had come to his aid. Considering her parting words, she didn't have much use for him. If Bob had survived his wound and asserted Laramie's innocence, why were the citizens so hot for his blood? If not, would Judy Anders willingly aid a man she thought shot her brother? He thrilled at the memory of her, standing there with the horse that saved his life. If only I weren't a Laramie. A good three hours before sundown, Buck was approaching the entrance to the hideout. 
He had left signs farther down the trail to indicate the best way for Waters' men to follow him. Having dismounted some distance from the tunnel, he stole cautiously forward. He was halfway to the tunnel when he glimpsed the new sentry, sitting several yards from the mouth, near a clump of bushes. It was the scar-faced fellow Harrison had called Braxton, and he seemed wide awake. Buck began a stealthy and necessarily slow advance on the guard, swinging in a circle that would bring him behind the man. He crept up to within a dozen feet, obscured by a clump of mesquite bushes. Gathering a handful of pebbles, he rose quietly to his knees and threw them over the guard's head. What the hell was that? Braxton glared in the direction of the sound with his Winchester half-lifted. And that was when Laramie leapt for him with his six-gun raised like a club. <laughs> Braxton slumped full length and lay still. Laramie took the belt and neckerchief from the unconscious man and bound and gagged his captive securely. He took the man's pistol, rifle, and spare bullets, then dragged him away from the tunnel mouth and shoved him in among a cluster of rocks and bushes, effectively concealing him from the casual glance. So far, so good. The success of the next step depended on whether or not all the outlaws of Harrison's band were in the hideout. Mark Raleigh was probably still back in San Leon, but Buck knew he should assume that all the other outlaws were inside. Slinging Braxton's rifle over his shoulder, he glanced up to a ledge overhanging the tunnel mouth, where stood precariously balanced the huge boulder which had given him the idea for this stage of the plan. All I need now is a lever. A broken tree limb sufficed for that, and a few moments later he had climbed to the ledge and was at work on the boulder. He felt a moment's panic as he feared its base was too deeply embedded, but under his fierce efforts, he felt the great mass give at last. The boulder toppled down into the tunnel entrance and jammed there, almost filling the space. The minor avalanche the boulder caused managed to fill any sizable gaps with smaller stones. The only way his enemies could get out now was by climbing the canyon walls, a feat he considered practically impossible, or by laboriously picking out the stones that had fallen around the boulder. At the spot on the canyon rim where he had spied upon the hideout that morning, he forded himself by the simple procedure of crouching behind a fair-sized rock with a Winchester and pistols handy at his elbows. He had scarcely taken his position when he saw a mob of riders breaking away from the corral behind the cabin. He counted 25 of them. Laramie squinted along the blue rifle barrel, waiting till the men were within about 300 yards of his position. Here we go. Dust spurted in front of the horse's hooves, and the riders scattered like quail. Drop your guns and hoist your heads! The tunnel's blocked and you can't get out! You go to hell! Buck hadn't expected any other reply. His shout had been more for rhetorical effect than anything else. But there was nothing theatrical about his second shot, which knocked a man out of his saddle. The outlaws converged toward the tunnel entrance, firing as they rode, aiming at Buck's position, which they had finally located. Laramie replied in kind. Then half a dozen men in the lead jammed into the tunnel and found that Buck wasn't lying. The others slid from their horses and took cover behind the rocks that littered the edges of the canyon, dragging the wounded men with them. From a rush and a dash, the fight settled to a slow, deadly grind, with no one taking any chances. Having located Buck's small fort, the men below concentrated their fire on the spot of the rim he occupied. He had not seen either Raleigh or Harrison. Raleigh, he hoped, was still in San Leon, but the absence of Harrison worried him. If he too had gone to San Leon, there was every chance that he might get clean away, even if his band was wiped out. There was another chance that he or Raleigh, or both of them, might return to the hideout and attack him from the rear. Buck cursed himself for not having divulged the true identity of the gang's leader to Judy Anders, but he couldn't think straight when he talked to her. He knew at least six men were in the tunnel. If he didn't discourage them, they would eventually be breaking through the block tunnel and taking shots at him from the rear. But to effect this discouragement meant leaving his point of vantage and giving the men below a chance to climb the canyon wall. He didn't believe this could be done, but then he didn't know what additions to the fortress had been made by the new occupants. They might have chiseled out handholds at some point on the wall. <sighs> You'd have to look at the tunnel. He worked his way down over the ledges. Where the devil are Joel's men? I can't keep these hombres hemmed up forever. Damn! 
Stones and brush had been worked out at one place in the tunnel mouth. And the head and shoulders of a man appeared. Get back in there! The fellow vanished back inside. Laramie crouched, glaring. They would try it again, soon. If he wasn't there to stop it, the whole gang would be squeezing out of the tunnel in no time. He couldn't get back to the rim and leave the tunnel unguarded, yet there was always the possibility of somebody climbing the canyon wall. Had he but known it, his fears were justified. For while Buck crouched on the ledge above, glaring down at the tunnel mouth, down in the canyon, a man was working toward a certain point of the cliff where his keen eyes had discerned something dangling. He had discovered Laramie's rope from his first venture to the canyon, hanging from the stunted tree on the rim. Cautiously, the man lifted himself out of the tall grass, ready to duck back in an instant. Then, as no shot came from the canyon rim, he scuttled like a rabbit toward the wall. Slinging his rifle on his back, he began swarming ape-like up the almost sheer wall. His outstretched arm grabbed the lower end of the rope, just as the others in the canyon saw what he was doing and began firing furiously at the rim to cover him. Yeah. Damn it. I hope they watch what they're shooting. The outlaw went up with amazing agility, his flesh crawling with the momentary expectation of a bullet in his back. The renewed firing drew Buck back to his perch on the canyon rim. He spared only a limited glance over the rocks, for the bullets were winging so close that he dared not lift his head high. He didn't see the man on the rope cover the last few feet in a scrambling rush and haul himself over the rim, unslinging his rifle as he did so. Laramie turned and headed back for the ledge where he could see the tunnel opening. And as he did so, he brought himself into full view of the outlaw who was standing upright on the rim by the stunted tree. Buck felt a numbing impact in his left shoulder, knocking him off his feet, and his head hit hard against a rock. Down below, an outlaw came scrambling out of the tunnel with desperate haste, followed by another and another. Buck blinked and glared, then oriented himself. He saw five riders sweeping toward the tunnel, and six outlaws who had rushed out while he was briefly unconscious, falling back into it for shelter. He recognized the leader of the newcomers as Slim Jones, Joel Waters' foreman. Take cover, Slim! A barrage of lead poured from the tunnel mouth into which the outlaws had disappeared. Slim lost a man before his crew swerved their horses out of line and fell back to cover. Laramie suddenly remembered the slug that had felled him and turned to scan the canyon rim. He saw the man by the stunted tree then, the fellow was helping one of his companions up the same route he had taken, and evidently thought that his shot had settled Laramie, as he was making no effort at concealment. Laramie lifted his rifle and pulled the trigger. Damn! But it was out of rifle cartridges. Below him, Joel Waters' ranch hands were futilely firing at the tunnel entrance, and the outlaws within were wisely holding their fire until they could see something to shoot at. Laramie crawled along a few feet to put himself out of range of the rifleman on the rim. Slim! Swing wide of that trail and come up here with your men! He was understood, for presently Slim and his three surviving men came crawling over the tangle of rocks, having necessarily abandoned their horses. About time you was getting here. Give me some 30-30s. A handful of cartridges were shoved into his eager fingers. <sighs> we come as soon as we could. Had to ride to the ranch to round up these men. Where's Waters? I left him in San Leon, <laughs> cussing a blue streak because he couldn't get nobody to listen to him. Folks got no more sense than cattle. Just as easy to stampede and as hard to stop once they bust loose. What about Bob Anders? Doctor said he was just creased. He was just fixing to go over there when me and Joel come into town and he had to wait and dress Joel's leg. Anders hadn't come to yet last time the doc was there. Buck felt some relief. At least Bob was going to live, even if he hadn't been able to name the man who shot him. Unless water sends us more men, we're licked. Tunnel's cleared and the men inside are climbing up the cliff. Damn, Buck! You're shot! Jones pointed to Buck's shoulder, the shirt soaked with blood. Can't do nothing for it now, it ain't bleeding much. Well, give me that bandana. He nodded the bandana into a crude bandage as he talked. Three, you stay here and watch that tunnel. Don't let nobody out, you hear? Me and Slim are gonna circle around and argue with the gents climbing the cliffs. Come on, Slim. It was rough climbing, and Laramie's shoulder burned like fire, with a dull throbbing that told him the lead was pressing near a bone. But he set his teeth and crawled over the rough rocks, keeping out of sight of the men in the canyon below, until they had reached a point behind his tiny fort on the rim, and that much closer to the stunted tree. 
They had kept below the crest and had not been sighted by the outlaws on the rim, who had been engrossed in knotting a second rope, brought up by the second man, to the end of the lariat tied to the tree. This had been dropped down the wall again, and now another outlaw was hanging to the rope and being drawn straight up the cliff like a water bucket by his two friends above. Slim and Laramie fired. Slim's bullet burned the fingers of a man clinging to the lariat. He let go of the rope and fell to the canyon floor. Laramie winged one of the men on the cliff, but it didn't affect his speed as he raced after his companion in a flight for cover. A barrage came up from the canyon as the men below spotted Laramie and his companion. Laramie and Slim ducked back, but continued firing after the men fleeing along the rim of the cliff and made no attempt to make a stand. They knew that the lone defender had received reinforcements, and they weren't stopping to learn in what force. Buck and Slim caught fleeting glimpses of the fugitives as they headed out through the hills. Let them go. Be no more trouble from that quarter. I bet them rannies won't try to climb that rope no more. Come on. I hear guns talking back at the tunnel. Buck and Slim reached the punchers on the ledge in time to see three horsemen streaking it down the trail, with lead humming after them. Three more figures lay sprawled about the mouth of the tunnel, which had been substantially cleared. One of Slim's men was aiming after the fleeing men. They busted out on horseback. Come so fast we couldn't stop them all. One of the fleeing horsemen swayed in his saddle as the three ducked into the trees and out of sight. <sighs> They'll be hitting a trail now. No, they won't. They was bound to see us. They know they ain't but five of us. They won't go far. They'll be sneaking back to shoot us in the back when their friends start busting out again. Well, there's no racket coming from the tunnel now. They're laying low for a spell. Too damn risky now. They didn't have but six horses in the tunnel. They gotta catch more and bring them to the tunnel before they can make the rush. Now wait till dark. And then we can't stop them unless we get more men. Slim, climb back up on the rim and lay down behind them rocks I stacked up. Watch that rope so nobody climbs it. We gotta cut that as soon as it gets dark. And don't let no horses be brought into the tunnel, if you can help it. Slim took off, and a few moments later, his rifle could be heard. They're already at it! Wait! Listen! They could hear it from down the trail, out of sight among the trees. After a pause, a crowd of men burst into view. Reinforcements, by golly! It's a regular army! Looks like old San Leon is there! Hey, boys! Don't get in line with that tunnel mouth! Spread out along the trail! Hey, who's them three fellas they got tied to their saddles? The three that broke loose from the tunnel. They scooped them in as they come. Looks like everybody's there. There's Charlie Ross and Jim Watkins, the mayor, and Lon Evans, Mart Raleigh's bartender. Reckon he didn't know his boss was a crook. And by golly, look who's leading them! Bob Anders! Buck stared at the pale-faced but erect figure who, with bandaged head, rode ahead of the 30 or 40 men who came up the trail and swung wide through the brush to avoid the tunnel mouth. Anders saw Buck and waved his hand. Rifles were firing from the tunnel now, and the riders swung from their horses and began to take up positions on each side of the trail as Anders took in the situation at a glance. The townsmen's guns began to answer the shots of the outlaws. Laramie came clambering down the cliff to shake Anders' outstretched hand. I came to just about the time you hit town today, Laramie. I was just telling Judy it couldn't have been you that shot me when all that hell busted loose and Judy run to help you out if she could. By the time I could get my clothes on, talk down the doctor, and get on the streets, you was gone with these addleheads chasing you. We had to wait till they gave up the chase and come back, and then me and Judy and Joe Waters lit into them. The time we got through, they was mighty contrite and aching to take a hand in your game. Oh, you all a lot. Especially your sister. Where's Raleigh? We thought he was with us when we lit out after you. But when we started back, we missed him. On the rim above them, Slim was firing frantically. Look out! They're rushing through the tunnel on horses! Damn it! Why ain't somebody up here with me? I can't stop them all! Evidently, the gang inside the canyon had been whipped to desperation by the arrival of the reinforcements, for they came thundering through the tunnel, laying down a barrage of lead. total chaos. They ran full into a blast of lead that piled screaming horses and writhing men in a red shambles. The survivors staggered back into the tunnel. Struck by a sudden thought, Laramie gripped among the bushes and hauled out the guard, Braxton, still bound and gagged. He was conscious now and glared balefully at his captor. 
Buck tore the gag off. Where's Harrison and Raleigh? Raleigh rode for San Leon after you got away from us this morning. Harrison's gone. Got scared and pulled out. I don't know where he went. You're lying. What'd you ask me for if you know so much? You mean Harrison's in on this, Buck? Joel told me about Raleigh. In on it. Harrison is the kingpin and Raleigh's his chief sidewinder. I ain't seen neither Harrison nor Raleigh since I got here. We just locked them to double-cross their own men and run off with the loot they already got. But we still got this nest to clean out and here's my idea. Them that's still alive in the canyon are denned up in or near the tunnel. Nobody near the cabin. If four or five of us can get hold up in there, we'll have them from both sides. We'll tie some lariats together and some of us will go down the walls and get in the cabin. We'll scatter men along the rim to see that none of them climb out. And we'll leave plenty of men here to hold the tunnel if they try that again, which they will as soon as it begins to get dark if we don't scuttle them first. Whew. You ought to have been the general, cowboy. Me and Slim and a couple of the Bar X boys will go for the cap. You better stay here. Your shoulder ain't fit for tightrope work and such. No. I aim to finish what I started. All right. Let's go. Ten minutes later found the party of five clustered on the canyon rim. The sun hadn't yet set beyond the peaks, but the canyon below was in shadow. The spot Laramie had chosen for descent was some distance beyond the stunted tree. The rim there was higher, the wall even more precipitous. It had the advantage, however, of an outjet of rock that would partially serve to hide the descent of a man on a lariat from the men lurking below. And if anyone did observe the descent of the five invaders, there was no sign of it. Laramie came last, clinging with one hand and gritting his teeth against the pain of his wounded shoulder. The slow, torturous crawl across the canyon floor seemed endless, but they reached their goal with still enough light for their purpose. The cabin doors were shut, the windows closely shuttered. Anders had one hand on the door, drawn Colt in the other. Let's go! Wait! I stuck my head into a loop here once already today. You all stay here while I head around to the back and look things over from that side. Don't go in till you hear me holler. Then Buck was sneaking around the cabin, gun in hand. He was little more than half the distance to the back when he was paralyzed to hear a voice from inside the cabin. All clear! What? Before he could move or shout a warning, he heard Anders answer. Coming, Buck! Come on in, Sheriff! Huh! What the hell? With sick fury, Laramie realized that somebody lurking inside the cabin somehow knew what they were up to and tricked the sheriff into entering. Now we can make terms, gentlemen. We've got your sheriff! You give us free passage to Mexico, or he's a dead man. Buck charged for the rear of the house. Anders would never agree to buying freedom for that gang to save his own life. And Laramie knew that whatever truce might be agreed upon, Harrison would never let the sheriff live. Buck also knew that the rear door was of ordinary thin paneling. Bracing his good right shoulder, Laramie rammed his full charging weight against it. The door crashed inward, and he catapulted into the room gun first. He saw a man wheeling from the doorway that led into the main room, and then he ducked and jerked the trigger as a knife sank past his head. The knife thrower hit the floor and lay twitching. Laramie caught a glimpse of men standing momentarily frozen in the act of tying Bob Anders to a chair. Eli Harrison, a Mexican man, and Mart Wally. Then all hell broke loose. The bound Bob Anders lurched out of the chair, rolling clumsily toward the wall. Buck half rolled behind the partial cover of a cast iron stove, drawing his second gun. Mark Rowley fled to the bunk room, shooting as he went. He crouched inside the door, awaiting his chance. But Harrison, already badly wounded, went berserk. Disdaining cover, touched with madness, he came storming across the room, firing away. <laughs> Buck raised himself to his full height and put a bullet through Harrison's heart. With one cartridge left in his last gun, Laramie leaned back against the wall, out of range of the bunk room. Come on out, Raleigh. Harrison's dead. Your game's played out. No, it ain't. Not till you're bleeding out, you son of a bitch. But before I kill you, I want you to know that you won't be the first Laramie I've sent to hell. I'd have thought you'd have known me, in spite of these whiskers. My real name's Rawlins. Rawlins? You're the one who killed Luke! That's right. <laughs> I made friends with your brother and got him drunk till he told me all about this hideout and the trails across the desert. 
Then when he was too drunk to stand, I shot him in the back, just to keep his mouth shut. Now what are you gonna do about it, Bucky? Nothing much. I'm just gonna kill you. Sheriff? Buck? Are you all right? Just at that moment, Slim and the men with him started through the doorway that Buck had burst through. Rollins swung his gun in their direction, leaning out just enough to give Buck a target. Halt. Buck's last bullet punched a neat hole in the head of his brother's murderer. Holy mother. There sure are a lot of dead people in here. Slim, see if Bob's hurt. I'm fine. I fell out of the chair and rolled out of the line of fire when the lead started slinging. My hands are tied, though. Cut him loose, Slim. I'm feeling kind of poorly. Like a man in a daze, Buck staggered to a chair and sank down heavily on it. He was hardly aware when Bob Anders came and cut his blood-soaked shirt away and washed his wounds, dressing them as best he could with strips torn from his own shirt and whiskey from a jug found on the table. As Buck and the sheriff emerged into the cool dusk, Slim came running up. The men in the tunnel, they're making a parley, Bob. They want to know if they'll be give a fair trial if they surrender. I'll talk to them. The rest of you keep under cover. At the head of the canyon, the sheriff stopped when he was within earshot of the men in and about the tunnel. Are you men ready to give in? What's your terms, sheriff? I ain't making terms. You'll all get a fair trial and an honest court. You better make up your minds. I know there ain't a lot of you left. Harrison's dead and so is Raleigh. I got 40 men outside this canyon and enough inside behind you to wipe you out. Throw your guns out here where I can see them and come out with your hands high. Rifles and pistols were tossed on the bare earth and with their hands in the air, haggard, blood-stained, powder-blackened men rose from behind the rocks and came out of the tunnel. We give up. Four of the boys are laying back amongst the rocks, too shut up to move under their own power. One's got a broke leg where his horse fell on him. Some of the rest of us need to have wounds dressed. Laramie and Slim and the punchers came out of cover, with guns trained on the weary outlaws. All right, men. Let's get those four wounded out of the rocks, and we'll see what we can do for them. A curious parade came filing through the tunnel into the outer valley where twilight still lingered. And as Buck Laramie emerged from that dark tunnel, he felt as if his dark past had fallen from him like a worn-out coat. Sheriff Anderson Buck talked to the man who'd acted as spokesman for the outlaws. How did Harrison get mixed up in this deal? Mixed hell. He planned the whole thing. He was cashier in the bank when the Laramies robbed it. The real ones, I mean. If it hadn't been for that robbery, old Brown would have soon found out that Harrison was stealing from him. But the Laramies killed Brown and give Harrison a chance to cover his tracks. They got blamed for what he'd stole, as well as the money they actually took. And that give Harrison an idea. The Laramies had acted as scapegoats for him once, and he aimed to use them again. But he had to wait till he could get to be president of the bank, and had taken time to round up a gang. So he ruined the ranchers and send his coyotes out of the country and then be king of San Leon. We know that part of it. Where'd Rollins come in? Harrison knowed him years ago on the Rio Grande. When Harrison aimed to raise his gang, he went to Mexico and found Rollins. Harrison knowed the real Laramies had a secret hideout, so Rollins made friends with Luke Laramie and... Uh... Yeah, we know all about that. Oh, well... Everything was fine till word come from Mexico that Buck Laramie was riding up from there. Harrison got skittish. He thought Laramie was coming to take toll for his brother. So he sent Rollins to waylay Laramie. <laughs> Rollins missed, but later went on to San Leon to try again. He shot you instead, Anders. Where was out to get you anyway? You'd been prowling too close to our hideout to suit Harrison. Harrison seemed to go kind of loco when he first heard Laramie was heading this way. He made us pull that fool stun of a fake bank hold up so he could act the hero and nobody would suspect him. Hell, nobody suspected him anyway. Any risk coming out here. But he was panicky and wanted us to get ready to make a clean sweep tonight and pull out. When Laramie got away from us this morning, Harrison decided he'd ride to Mexico with us. Well, when the fighting started, Harrison and Raleigh stayed out of sight. 
I guess there's nothing they could do, and they hoped we'd be able to break out of the canyon. See, they didn't want to be seen and recognized. If it turned out Laramie hadn't told anybody he was head of the gang, Harrison would have been able to stay on then. Preparations were being made to start back to San Leon with the prisoners, when a sheepish-looking delegation headed by Mayor Jim Watkins approached Buck. Um, look here, Laramie, we, uh, <coughs> we owe you something now, and we're just as hard to pay our debts as you are to pay yours. Harrison had a small ranch out a ways from town, which he ain't needin' no more, and he ain't got no heirs, so we can get it easy enough. We thought if you was aiming maybe to stay around San Leon, we'd like to make you a present of that ranch and kind of help you get a start in the cow business. And we don't want the 50,000 water said you aim to give us. You've wiped out that debt. A curious melancholy had settled over Buck. After all the furious emotions of the past few days, he felt weary and a bit lost. Well, thanks. But I'm paying that 50,000 back to the men it belonged to. And I'll be moving on tomorrow. Where to? Uh, I don't know yet. Well, you think it over. Let's go, Buck. You need some attention on them wounds. You go ahead, Bob. I'll be alone. I kind of want to sit here and rest. A vital chapter in Buck Laramie's life had closed. He had kept his vow. Now, he had no plan or purpose to take its place. Hey, the buckboard. And look who's driving. Laramie's heart gave a convulsive leap and then started pounding as he saw the slim, supple figure beside Joel Waters. She pulled up near them and handed the lines to Slim, who sprang to help her down. Oh, careful, miss. Ah, biggest fight ever fought in San Leon County, and I didn't get to fire a shot. Cuss a busted leg anyway. You done a man's part anyway, Joe. And then Buck forgot Joel Waters entirely in the miracle of seeing Judy Anders standing before him, smiling gently, her hand outstretched, and the rising moon melting her soft hair to golden. I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you today. I've been bitter about things that were none of your fault. D don't, don't apologize. Please, you saved my neck. You was probably right anyhow. Um, anyway, Bob went down the trail with the others. You must have missed him. I saw him and talked to him. I came on, expecting to meet you. You, you came on to meet me? Oh, of course, J Joe would want to see how bad I was shot up. Mr. Waters wanted to see you, of course. But I, Buck, I wanted to see you too. She was leaning close to him, looking up at him. And he was dizzy with the fragrance and beauty of her. You did? What, what would you want to see me for? I wanted to apologize for my rudeness this morning. I, I told you not to apologize. You saved my life, and I... I... I oh, heck, Judy, I love you. <sighs> Buck was frozen by his own audacity, stunned and paralyzed. But suddenly, Judy was in his arms. Oh, oh I love you too, Buck. I've loved you ever since I was a little girl and we went to school together. Only I've tried to force myself not to think of you for the past six years. But I've loved the memory of you. That's why it hurt me so to think that you'd gone bad as I thought you had. Oh, Buck, to learn you're straight and honorable is like having a black shadow lifted from between us. You'll never leave me, Buck. Leave you? Huh. Just long enough to find the mayor and tell him I'm taking him up on an offer he made. And then I'm aiming on spending the rest of my life making you happy. Mm. <laughs> I reckon they'll be a marrying in these parts pretty soon, Slim. Woohoo! Looks like it. Who knows? I'm liable to get married myself any day now. You don't say. Why, sure. It's just a matter of time till I decide what type of woman would make me the best wife. And there we go. Thanks for joining us this week and indeed every week on the Sonic Society. Well, we're finishing off season 13. Please don't worry. Season 14 will be back in September along with myself and David Alt. At least I hope so. Of course, Jack. I, oh, good. I, I, unless you're kicking me off the show for being too British. I never take British. anything for granted anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, I shall be here. Um, touch wood. Oh, wonderful. So, yes. Wonderful. It'll be good. And for those new to the feed, don't worry, we are not pod fading for the summer. This is the beginning, or next week marks the beginning of our special Sonic Summerstock Playhouse Productions, where producers of audio drama companies present their own take on classic old-time radio scripts. Promises to be another stellar year, and another stellar host with David Alt, oh, of course. Oh, who is David oh, Alt really? lining up the stage <laughs> <laughs> until next week, and the beginning of Sonic Summerstock Thank you, everyone, and especially thank you, David. It's a thank real you, thrill Jack. for me to do this with you, my friend. Thank you so much. It's it's my pleasure. Thank you, Jack. Good night, everyone. Good night. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hi there, and welcome to Season 13, Episode 565. Saddle up with my new co-host, Cow Punching Star. My new? Yeah, I'll try, try that say. again. <laughs> <laughs> Chauncey Haworth, Mark Slade, and Lothar Tuppen. The demented minds behind the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour bring you... Twisted Pulp Magazine. A journey beyond surreality to worlds you never knew or hoped existed. Worlds of the supernatural. Worlds of dark satire. Worlds of nightmarish futures. Twisted Pulp Magazine. If you thought the 21st century was weird enough already, think again. Twisted Pulp Magazine. A step beyond your grandfather's pulp. Available at digitalvaudeville.com. That's D I G I T A L V A U D E V I L L E dot com. Mm-hmm.